Hello and welcome to Virtual Monsterama 2020 and another great panel. Uh, today we're talking about local and lesser known monsters uh, on a long and lonely highway east of Omaha, monsters. And we've got some great panelists today. Uh, I want to go around the Zoom Brady Bunch window here and have everybody introduce themselves and tell us about uh, what uh, you're maybe excited about with this panel and talking about local monsters and some folklore. And why don't we start to my upper left with Justine. I'm Justine Labello. I'm the president of the Georgia Reptile Society. And I've got a baby Burmese python with me who will probably make an appearance for a little while. I might switch her out with someone else later in the panel. Did y'all hear that? <laughs> she said hello. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I'm, I'm happy to be here um, when it comes to local monster legends. Some of them are actually animals mistaken for legends. So um, I know a little bit about that. So thanks for having me. All right. Thank you. Thank you for being here. John. I'm John Hartness. I'm the founder and publisher of Falstaff Books, an independent press based out of Charlotte, North Carolina, publishing such award-winning authors as Michael G. Williams, who you'll hear from a little later. More relevant to this discussion, I'm the creator of the Bubba the Monster Hunter series of comedic horror short stories and novellas, which has spawned an entire shared universe of novellas and books with other writers writing their regional monsters. So I have been exposed to a wealth of the different types of monsters all around the U.S. and have emailed many of my authors saying, okay, is this folklore or did you make this up? Thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, how about uh, Allison? Hello everyone, I am Allison Rieger Cook, I, uh, right under A.R. Cook is my pen name. I, run, I write young adult fantasy. Um, my main trilogy is the Scholar and the Sphinx trilogy uh, that came out a few years ago. I've also written a high fantasy series I'm currently in the middle of called the Scale Seekers series. I've also written short stories for various anthologies. In fact, one is coming out in October called Women of the Woods. It's actually going to be a great Halloween read because it's all about witches and sorceresses and various uh, women who live in the woods, as the title says. Um, I'm also currently working on some screenwriting. I recently placed in the Austin Film Festival this year, so I'm very excited about that. Awesome. And rounding us out, Michael. I'm Michael G. Williams. Uh, you just heard my publisher talk about the fact that I won the 2020 Mainly Wade Wellman Award from the North Carolina Speculative Fiction Foundation for my sci-fi detective novel, A Fall in Autumn. I write urban fantasy, science fiction, horror, um, what I would describe as wry horror, uh, as opposed to like comedic horror. Anyway, horror with a sense of humor, you know. But I'm also the co-host of Arcane Carolinas, a podcast about monsters, local legends, the unexplained, things like that in North and South Carolina. Awesome. Well, thank you all for being here. And thank you, John. You're going to have to uh, get some money from Michael after this for all of the advertising. Uh, excellent teamwork. <laughs> okay, I, I want to actually get sold. We both get paid. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> actually, I want to start with you, Michael, uh, since you <clears throat> have spent a lot of time working on the Arcane Carolinas podcast in preparation for this panel discussion today. I listened to some of the episodes and really interesting stuff, uh, and y'all have a lot of fun with it, too. Uh, I was laughing almost the whole time, uh, as well as learning. Uh, so tell us a little bit about the, uh, the, the research process and, and the, the depth of uh, your experience initially diving into this research of fact and fiction around local folklore. You know, Arcane Carolina has got its start because <laughs> Charlie and I work together at our day job and our office design and layout and attrition of other coworkers leaving and things like that, retiring, et cetera, led them to have put Charlie and me at one end of the office by ourselves where we could just talk about whatever and in the course of like the next two or three months, we figured out that we were both 
huge fans of the X-Files, huge fans of monster stories, huge fans of the unexplained in general. And that like really led us to start digging around into this stuff. And then it turned out that Charlie really loves monster stories and really loves local monsters. And I've always had a real love for local monsters. And so we ultimately decided we've got to do something where we can talk about these sorts of things, especially because we both figured out that we love using local monster legends when we're running D&D games. You know, we like to like pull that sort of real world stuff that somebody might recognize from our local environment into those fictional worlds. And as a writer, I've, you know, oftentimes wanted to incorporate more Carolina's legends and lore in the things that I write. My urban fantasy vampire series is set entirely in North Carolina, in real places in North Carolina, and, uh, and touches on some local history in those places. So... That was really sort of how we got started. In terms of our research process, we have had so many people instantly appear in our email or on Twitter or wherever and want to tell us about the local monsters near them or ask us about a legend that's near them somewhere in the Carolinas. So a lot of times, you know, we've just heard about stuff from people that we know or people who are listening to it. And then the research process is really, A, what can we dig up that is the surface level story that most people who have at least heard of whatever the legend is will know. For instance, Normie, the Lake Norman monster near John. Everybody has heard, everybody who's into monster stuff has heard that there is maybe a monster in Lake Norman and that it's named Normie. And maybe they've heard that some people believe it's a giant catfish. And then we start digging into what's the history of that location. Is it possible that there's a way to explain that, yes, there might be giant mutant catfish in Lake Norman? Well, it turns out that it's, you know, got a bunch of radioactive waste in the background. Not radioactive waste, but there is a bunch of background radiation because it's near a nuclear plant, things like that. Buried cities that are uh, underwater from when the lake was constructed. All kinds of interesting, weird stories, tons of UFO stories around Lake Norman. And as soon as we can start unearthing stuff like that, then we try to figure out, A, is there that connection to real history, however tenuous it is? And B, uh, even if that connection isn't there, like if we were just going to imagine what the explanations would be, what's sort of the worst case scenario explanation for these things? And how much fun can we have with those? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love it. It's it's a lot of uh, a lot of fun. If you haven't listened to Arcane Carolina's podcast, you really should check it out. Uh, okay, and, and so Allison, uh, why don't you can continue the conversation there and, and tell us your kind of uh, connection or or initiation to local folklore and and monsters. Okay, well, actually, for my series, the Scholar in the Sphinx series, a lot of the folklore and mythology I was pulling into kind of was all over the world. It was there was Greek and some Russian and some everywhere. Um, so, but yeah, then I did actually start looking into some um, American folklore. Um, in fact, in the first book, there's some Native American folklore. And that started getting me wondering, because I'm originally from and currently actually moved back to the Chicagoland area. So for this panel, I was like, oh, well, I haven't really touched on the kind of folklore that's been in the Midwest for a while. And I actually talked to my parents, like, I'm going to be on this panel about local folklore and they the first thing they said was oh like the hodag i go okay i i think i know what this is. in fact i think i saw an episode of scooby-doo where they talk about the hodag so <laughs> let me look this up and yeah it's actually been folklore it originated around rhinelander wisconsin my dad's from wisconsin and it's been around since like the 1890s and apparently has even shown up in some of the paul bunyan stories i was never aware of this before and there's even a high school up there that they call them their team, sports team are the Hogdags. So obviously it's been in that area for a while and it's kind of this cool like frog lizard demon monster. So I, was, I just thought that was really interesting. That, that was the first thing my parents thought like, oh, the Hogdag, yeah, they grew up with this story. So I thought that was really cool. What does their mascot dress like? <laughs> I was gonna ask the same thing. I don't know if I found a picture of the mascot, but the pictures I've seen, it's like, kind of a big bulbous frog head and scaly body and horns and tusks kind of every dangerous monster appendage that could possibly spiked tail so i'm gonna have to go find a picture of what the mascot looks like i mean they kind of threw every 
<laughs> horrific thing they put into this monster. Well, that's because you do ice fishing up there, right? And you got to be real drunk to fish on the ice. <laughs> so. Well, I found out a lot of the local monsters up here in the Midwest, a lot of them around 1970, in the 1970s. I'm like, there's probably a reason for that. By right right around the end of the 60s, 1970s, all of a sudden all these monsters started popping up in the news. Yeah, because the bad brown acid started off in upstate New York and trickled down <laughs> to where you trickled over to where you are, and that's how you got a hodag, you know. Exactly. I think I think there is a direct correlation with alcohol or uh anything uh, you know, like alien abduction. Oh, yeah. uh, it's really late at night and it's a couple strolling out at midnight for some reason and all of a sudden in front of their car they see something. <laughs> Had pink eyes and a massive head and claws. <laughs> well your description of the hodag kind of sounded like Pickman's model there uh, at, at first but that was interesting uh, and I actually really love the idea of this group right here kind of like the meddling kids on Scooby-Doo it's, it's really uh, I like that it's good analogy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so Justine how about you what was your kind of uh, initiation into uh, folklore and so uh, in my community like most of us are just um, citizen scientists, you know, I'm not a biologist, but I do um, want to protect the species, but cryptozoology is something that uh, interests a lot of people. Uh, when you look at the cryptozoology in North America, especially the Americas, a lot of the animals or creatures that you see are big reptiles. Uh, there's actually one in Indiana, it's called the Beast of Bosco. It's just a big snapping turtle. And I've heard descriptions of it being, you know, larger than life, like as big as a truck, but they've actually found alligator snapping turtles quite large, so that one could be real. Um, lots of others that look like a Nessie, like a, um, you know, a flippered creature. There's a lot, there's actually a lot of scientists that think that there are some places in the Congo where some of these creatures might still exist. You know, if you go in the Congo, you're going to die of some disease or the natives are going to kill you, so there's no way to really know. Um, but the favorite one is Mothman. That one is a cryptozoology favorite, definitely. Uh, it's talked about all the time. Um, so, you know, when I look at it, you know, I don't, I don't want to say that they're not real. I want to say that some of them might be a creature that someone misidentified. Um, but it's, it's a lot of fun to see some of them. Like there's one called the caddy in Washington, and it looks like a siren, which is an actual animal. It's, a, it's only got two feet in the front, no feet in the back, and it's a big salamander. And uh, it looks like it looks like a siren, um, but it's, it's not. It's, it looks like they made it look like a Nessie sort of a thing, something more scary. And uh, I just, uh, cryptozoology has always fascinated me because I think there's a little bit of truth in it. Awesome. And so, John, I guess you're really close to Normie uh, and have. Yeah, yeah, we hang. Yeah, we're tight. <laughs> like and Normie, you know. He's the boy. Um, I actually just found out about Normie about two years ago. I've lived here for over for 25 years. I, all of my learning and experience with cryptozoology and folklore monsters has come through research for the Bubba series. When I created Bubba, he is the Southeastern Regional Monster Hunter for the Holy Roman Catholic Church and his name is Bubba. <laughs> so inherently, it's a comedy series. Well, if I'm going to have him be the Southeastern Regional Monster Hunter, he needs to go all over the Southeast and hunt monsters. So I need to research what monsters you've got in that part of the world and not ever use those. Because the comedy is in taking something from somewhere else. A big burly mountain monster in West Virginia, okay, that's fun. A Rakshasa with an LSU ball cap because go Tigers, that's comedy. So what I have been working towards with my work is juxtaposing out of the region folklore and dropping it in. And some of that mistaken identity that Justine was talking about, I've actually used in a book. I sent Bubba out to investigate a series of chupacabra attacks. 
except because he's Bubba and he's kind of an idiot, he could never remember the word chupacabra. So he went through every piece of the Taco Bell menu trying to figure out what he was hunting. And in the midst of chasing down the chimichanga and the chalupa and the quesadilla, he found out that it was a case of mistaken identity. It wasn't a Mexican, a Latin American goat sucking monster. It was, um, it was pacifist vampires sucking cattle dry instead. So learning what people's expectations are for a specific part of the world and then subverting those expectations are where I'm able to punch up the comedy. I have to say living your principles is an important psychological component to living forever. Also, <laughs> sucking down enough cattle blood to keep you going forever, too. Yeah. I said they were vegan vampires in the book, but they aren't really because they are, you know, eating cattle. But I'm not going to tell a vampire that they've got the definition of vegan wrong. Yeah, I don't think the conversation would go well. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, I, I wonder if uh, chupacabra meat uh, does the same thing to your stomach as uh, Taco Bell menu items. I don't know if I want to find out. There is no proof that Taco Bell meat is not actually made from chupacabras. <laughs> That's true. Next time on Arcane Carolinas. I got to go. I got a new idea for a book story. <laughs> yeah. so, uh... <laughs> to the Hollywood producers. Here's your idea. Uh, <laughs> uh, so uh, I want to hear your favorites. I want to hear your favorite local freak of the week, uh, you know, kind of monsters. Uh, you know, our our patron, uh, Darren, had kind of said uh, jokingly, this panel is brought to you by binge watching Supernatural. Uh, and so, you know, and I'm used to, to shows like uh, Smallville, even, you know, Freak of the Week and different things like that in the X-Files. Uh, so I want to hear your, your favorites uh, kind of local folklore monsters, either from maybe your part of the world or where you grew up or just the, your favorites, whoever wants to start. For me, it depends on who I'm editing at the time. Because I tend to keep my monsters in a fairly narrow canon until it's time to mock um, Tiger King and create a um, reptile park of were gators um, set in Florida. Because the fact that Tiger King did not take place in Florida is a massive injustice. That's the most Florida story ever. <laughs> but it depends on whether I'm editing Eric Asher, who writes the Mason Dixon Monster Hunter series for me. In that case, it's going to be a Galrao. But my current favorite is from Gail Martin's series, Spell, Salt, and Steel. And all of these are set in the Bubbaverse. Gail's book that just came out called Creature Feature features a hoop snake, which is a giant snake that bites its own tail and attacks people by rolling towards them. And I'm deathly afraid of snakes. So this is like the scariest thing I've ever published to me is the idea of a snake that will run after you. And I know that snakes can be fast, but for a fat dude, I can move if I'm motivated. So open bar, buffet, snakes are the three things that will get me hot footing it. And the idea of a snake that now drives, nah, bro, nah. So, and Gail and her husband, Larry, are from the wilds of Pennsylvania. And man, I did not know that rural Pennsylvania is just like rural North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, only with snow shovels and more flannel. But it is. And fewer, con and fewer vowels. Wow. <laughs> Uh, who else has uh, their favorites? Hard to pick one. These <laughs> um, Look, I'm actually working on two different projects that again stem from mythologies. And I guess my favorite right now is I was working on a screenplay where it's all kind. Of, it's going to incorporate various different kind of local folklore, Gothic folklore. And so the character I really like right now, her, um, her name is Lady Midday. 
and in folklore, she is this beautiful woman that would just kind of show up on the side of the road, if you're walking along the road, and she'd just be this beautiful woman, and she'd want to engage you in conversation. If you were a man, she would want to engage you in conversation, but you had to be very polite, and you couldn't change the topic, because the moment you got rude or changed the topic, she'd slice your head off with a scythe. So in the updated version, oh, and, she, and the reason she's called Lady Midday is she only appears in the afternoon. So in the morning or the evening, she disappears back to wherever she came from. So of course, in the screenplay, since it's a little more updated, she's swapped the scythe for a chainsaw. Gets the job okay. done. Faster. So no mansplaining, please. Exactly. This <laughs> is like the very <laughs> early version of don't mansplain to this one. It's interesting because that sounds a lot like an urban legend of uh, the woman in white who's a hitchhiker on remote roads. And if you pick her up and you're nice to her, she doesn't kill you. But if you pick her up and you're a douche, you're going to die, which seems perfect, like a perfectly reasoned response to me. But, you know, your mileage may vary. It is interesting how many stories do have that similar thread of if this mysterious fill in the blank walks up to you and they need your help, please help them. Because if you don't help them, you're going to be really sorry. So just be good. Be a kind person. Right. The early, early uh, ancient ways of manner, manner, teaching manners to children, right? One of the things that we talk about a lot on our King Carolinas is the notion that a lot of cryptozoological stories and a lot of folklore in general ultimately boil down to cautionary tales. And it's fascinating to me that people assume that other people are going to be sufficient jerks that they can't just say, be nice and help somebody if you see that they've, you know, had a flat tire or whatever. Uh, or if they're just walking along and want to have a brief conversation, have a brief conversation and be polite to them. And, and instead, it has to be backed up with, because they're going to kill you if you don't in some really bizarre exotic way that no one will ever believe and will probably be a little embarrassing to you. And Justine looks like it has a new visitor to our panel. Yeah, I had to put the snake away for a minute. She was, she was done. Um, this is my Lichianus gecko. Her name is Mumu and uh, she's really sweet. But my favorite is Champ. That's the, um, it's like a Nessie-like creature that's in Lake Champlain um, in New York. And uh, I like any of those, but that one, for some reason, has stuck with me since I was a kid. So um, Mothman just being more like, you know, it's the corgi of the cryptozoology. <laughs> you know, it's popular with everyone. Uh, <laughs> every, I mean, I have a corgi and she's wonderful, but, you know, it's like everybody likes it. So I'm like, yeah, Mothman's all right, but Champ's, Champ's my man, so. Yeah. And is there a, 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 like scientific reasoning behind Champ that, that their theories or anything? Well, you know, there's, there's still, the jury's still out, like, uh, like a plesiosaur-like creature. Now, obviously isn't going to live in a lake like that, I mean, and be hidden forever. That would be not, not, nothing's impossible, but not probable. But I mean, there have been some reports of, you know, fishermen, you know, pulling up these creatures that look like plesiosaurs and, oh, 94% of their DNA is basking sharks. So that's what it is. I'm like, it would be 100%. It wouldn't be 94%, you know. So it's just, there's, there's a lot, you know, obviously the scientific community, the jury's out because they think that, you know, when these extinctions happen, these creatures didn't survive. But we've also not explored a huge amount of our oceans and we don't know what's out there. So... I think cryptozoology is fun to me because it just, it opens up your mind, especially child's mind for, you know, the, the unknown, the, the discovery that's still out there. There's so much we don't know. Shauna McGuire, under her Mira Grant pseudonym, has a book called, that was, that I'm reading right now, called Beneath the Drowning Deep, that's all about the pieces of the ocean that we haven't explored yet. And what happens when we find out that mermaids are real and hungry. I think that uh, there's a lot of truth in fiction. You know, if, if you hear a story over and over and over again, it's like, you know, like the creation story. There's every religion has one. Every religion has a flood story. Something happened. It may not be exactly what they're describing, but something happened, you know, so it just, that's, that's why I love this stuff. 
because you never know what's out there. It's beginning to look a lot like fish, man. <laughs> That's a, yeah. Uh, well, so, you know, right here in Austin, we have this is maybe more of that corgi uh, kind of folklore creature, but uh, we have the albino squirrels. And uh, when my wife and I moved here five years ago, and we would sitting on the patio, and we'd see these albino squirrels, climb, like all of a sudden, it freaked us out. We're like, what the heck is that? And it wasn't just one, like one freak, you know, one off. No, it would be like six or seven around. And and then so I started Googling it and stuff like, oh, okay, it's a, uh, it's a real thing. It's just a uh, color, but they're just not all that, that popular, uh, common in the U.S., uh, but happened to be, you know, here in, in the Austin area. And then I start going down the rabbit hole and seeing th uh, articles about, one of the reasons why is because UT had uh, experiments on them and, and they were testing out for like DNA and, and heredity and all this kind of thing with the pigmentation. And then after they were done and the, the study basically got canceled, then they just released them out into the wild. And so then over, and that was in the 80s. And so then uh, as most, you know, of these urban legends started, right? Now, uh, then they, they then just go out and, to, to, and start mating and, and, and breeding and so forth. Um, so what, what, what do you think about then now as we get into like the modern uh, world and future and, and so forth, it seems maybe less and less as we encroach out into nature, either we're both exposing ourselves to the unknown as we're out in the uh, you know, country, uh, but then also science and technology is maybe uh, affecting and changing our our folklore. There's always going to be a gap between what we understand and what we observe. And we're always going to look to fill in that gap with a story that we've manufactured for it. You know, I like I, my favorite cryptid is the vampire beast of Bladenboro, which is, you know, for a few days in 19, the early 1950s in a tiny little town of 700, 800 people in North Carolina a whole bunch of animals were really horribly killed in what were obviously violent animal attacks. And eventually it became known as the Vampire Beast of Bladenboro because there was often not enough blood to account for the animals that were dead. And everybody sort of like had their different theories. And one theory that I like is that it's a species of cougar that in theory uh, went extinct in that area and throughout the Southeast around the turn of the 20th century, you know, the late 1800s, early 1900s, but that some population of them survived and resurfaced in that town and did the killing, which is great, except that the killing all stopped immediately afterwards and then resumed mysteriously 50 years later and things like that and reappeared in the early 21st century. Um, but the fact that we're better at mapping those areas now and the fact that we have a better understanding of zoology as opposed to cryptozoology and the fact that we have a better understanding of biology has not eliminated the human experience of these things it hasn't stopped us from as asking questions and in fact we have so many ways to answer questions now that we're way better i think at ginning up possible answers to the really mysterious questions without necessarily arriving at something that we can consider shared truth you know, I think that we have more ways to come up with the possibilities as a result of having more ways to analyze the experiences that we have. From a story standpoint, it gives us different and often darker places to go. Um, there have been several massive hit books and series recently about this very thing. The Passage by Justin Cronin is about essentially vampire as cryptid and what happens when you go somewhere that people don't go and there's a reason that people don't go there and you went there and thanks um chuck wendig's book from last year wanderers is at its root a you messed with stuff you weren't supposed to mess with and now the world's ending good job um so kind of as our science advances and as we push the as we push the green spaces the dark spaces 
the blue ocean spaces further away from us, we as storytellers feel a need to show more of them pushing back and harder. So as the spaces to explore shrink, the stakes of the exploration stories rise. So that's been an interesting evolution of those stories. It, it used to be that the story was, well, you go deep into the jungle and you bring back this ancient relic and it goes to the New York Museum of Natural History and it eats a couple of people in the museum and then Lee Preston and Lincoln Child have 20 book massive best-selling series. But what it then, but that was just a couple of people. And now the stories are the world ended. Yeah, the sequel's always got to be bigger than the original, right? Uh, and, yeah. <laughs> just, Justine, Allison, anything uh, you want to contribute to that? I think in a way, adding like the tech, especially your stories, if you're adding the technological scientific element, it can actually make it a little bit scarier because I think a lot of people think science explains it all. It'll figure it out eventually. So, you know, at first like, oh, whatever the magical strange thing. Well, that was someone's imagination. Obviously science can explain it. And then when science can't really explain all of it, then you go, what do you mean science can't explain? What do we have? And of course we forget science is just the, is the practice of ob observing. You know, that's really what science is. It's still us trying to make sense of the world just in a more step-by-step -step mathematical way. So rather than jumping to the, it was a thing with red eyes and teeth. And it's like, well, it may have had those things, but now we, maybe we can take it a little step further. So when science can't explain it, people really go, oh, what now what is this thing? I have nothing to fall back on. <laughs> what is this thing? So I, I think it's, more interesting to introduce those elements, especially in the story. Yeah, I I, I remember in, in growing. I, I'm from Georgia and and going camping up in the North Georgia mountains and uh, hearing about like kind of ghost stories about indigenous, you know, Native American tribes and so forth and those that died there and that kind of thing. And we'd be camping and we'd hear strange drumming off in the distance and we were like okay this is really freaky and then it would take hours and hours until we realized that it was just the way that the water and the river was going over deeper parts or rocks and you know things like that but we sufficiently freaked ourselves out uh from that and i think that that is it is it uh isn't it just part of of folklore that we to a degree require the darwin award winners like we we require a little bit of the ignorant uh people that are that are you know or or inebriated that maybe have these experiences and these perceptions uh that then tell their tales i certainly do but i write comedy so there certainly needs to be an element of hey y'all watch this or the other one, the other way that rednecks die, you ain't going to believe this. Exactly. And then uh, you won't believe what I saw. Come here. Let me show you. For real. Yeah. It's like, this is nasty. To have a bite. Yeah. No. No. Man, this thing was scary as hell. Come with me. No. No. Well, no. I have a friend. In the woods. <laughs> And I have a friend who was invited to her girlfriend's uh, <laughs> kind of bucket list trip to go into the woods. And they paid thousands of dollars for this to be escorted by the official Bigfoot Society and go in and, and actually have a long weekend trip where they were with maybe a dozen or so other people that were all trying to get a glimpse of Bigfoot. And they had a big truck that had like infrared detection devices and everything that you could see all night vision and everything. And it was recording, you know, all through the night. And, and they were really serious uh, about it. And she said she, she went through the, they didn't see any, anything. They didn't see any Sasquatch or anything. Really? I, I know. Uh, 
And, uh, and so she probably went in believing about 10% and then came out of it believing maybe 5% or maybe it was 5% and then came out 10%. I don't know. Uh, I don't think that you need necessarily drunks to have these experiences. I think you need drunks to tell you that you've had, that they've had these experiences. I think that everybody, well, I think a lot of people have had experiences like this and they never tell anybody that, you know, if any, if making a podcast about the arcane and unexplained has taught me anything, it is that it will take seconds for people to start telling you the experiences that they've had, as long as the microphones are off and, uh, <laughs> and they know that you're interested in that kind of thing. But a lot of people I know have, have had this stuff bottled up inside. I had coworkers that I had forgotten were even following me on Twitter. People from my day job send me direct messages on Twitter when I tweeted about having started a podcast about this stuff to send me links to the things from their towns that they've experienced. They would never have brought this up in a work context. I was shocked that these people were willing to tell me these stories but they've had this stuff boiling inside and they're worried that if they tell anybody, they'll become the drunk who saw the thing on the road at night. And if that's not your brand, that's a problem. Exactly. <laughs> Some of us, it's okay. Right. Yeah. You know, like speculative fiction has been, has been obsessed with trying to answer these questions and, and has been looking to science to try to answer these questions for centuries at this point. You know, Mary Shelley didn't write Frankenstein so that she could answer the question of what does it mean to be alive? She wrote that book to ask the question knowing that it wasn't gonna get answered anytime soon. You know, and, and everything from Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's The Lost World up to the Jurassic Park movies and the Jurassic World movies isn't an exercise in resolving the question of how do we prove that there's no way to bring dinosaurs back. They're just deeper explorations of like, what can we see and what's weird and, and interesting and different. And people really leap into fandom of those things and interest in those things because I have never seen a dinosaur, sure. But I have had the experience of being told later that the sound that I heard in the mountains around me was of a mountain lion that is another kind of big cat that was supposedly extinct. You know, but as a small child, having my grandmother say that sound that you think is someone screaming is a cat. That was a, made a big impression on me. And, and emotionally, those sorts of experiences really do leave an impression on us. And so, Justine, I'm curious, and I believe if I'm not wrong, I just saw an article the other day that talked about a, a believed to be extinct cougar or or a cat of some kind big cat that was sighted for the first time in like a decade or decades i am not sure what part of the country it was uh mountains of somewhere so i'm curious justine with uh reptiles do you believe or there might be some extinct or larger reptilian creatures that are maybe hiding beneath the surface or, or, or in out of sight? That's, that's very possible. Um, you know, we're discovering new reptiles and amphibians every day. So that's, that's happening right now, but they're not large. You know, they're usually very small, like, there's a, <laughs> threw me off a bit. Um, lots of, uh, you know, small animals like uh, dart frogs and um, the Amazon, that sort of thing. Lots of animals in the Congo that they're discovering. Um, reptiles that we thought were extinct are being found again. That big cat story, I do remember call that. It was, um, it was in North America, I think. Some kind of mountain lion. Um, and uh, it's like, it's a subspecies of a larger group of animals, but they, they thought it was extinct. Um, and then you know, speciation is another thing I can get into, but, you know, animals we thought were extinct are very similar to something that does exist. Where do you draw the line? Scientists are constantly renaming animals. Um, as far as, you know, dinosaurs, which I think is the bigger thing, you know, the, you know, Nessie is actually an extinct marine reptile. I, I do want to believe that big marine reptiles still are out there and are just hiding. Um, you know, the, the biggest one we know of in existence is the crocodile and the alligators. Um, but I, I do think like with all the oceans we haven't explored, there, there's something out there we haven't seen yet um, that 
may never show itself, you know, unless we start exploring the deep oceans, which we might start doing if we keep on uh, ruining the land <laughs> that we're living on. Um, so there's, there's no telling. I mean, there's also some people who think that Tasmanian uh, tigers are still around. Um, there's uh, been quite a few sightings of those. Uh, you know, uh, I think there was like one video evidence, but it was really hard to tell if it was a dog or a Tasmanian tiger. Um, but I mean, who's to say there's a lot of Australia that hasn't been explored either because it's just so vast and, you know, not very welcoming to humans. So, um, you know, it's, yeah, I do think that there's stuff out there we haven't seen yet. And uh, Allison, John, and Michael, I mean, as far as fiction, do you think that we, for the future of, of this kind of, you know, horror fiction, monster fiction, uh, that w what what's next? Uh, I know we have like Godzilla, for instance, that was a, a message about you know nuclear war and 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 that kind of thing. Um, so what what do you think's next for monster fiction and maybe this kind of folklore? We've had some great movies recently, you know, about that kind of you know ambiance. Uh, but what do you what do you think? What do you think's next? I wish I knew because then I'd write it and hopefully be very successful with it. Um, I think it's interesting that it seems like, well, especially some of the more recent films like Bird Box or Quiet Place, there's less of the visual monster. It's a lot more psychological. It's all, it's in your head. You never see, you know, it's not something on screen. And that, of course, is, is kind of unknown, is scary. I think we're tapping into the fact that sometimes no physical monster is scarier than seeing Godzilla, because at least then you know what it is and you know what it looks like and you can maybe figure out how to take it down, but how do you take down something you don't even know what it looks like? So, I don't know if we'll keep heading in that direction, but that seems to be, well, it's also more cost effective to have nothing on screen too. So win-win for movie producers. Absolutely. Horror is always, it always has an element of social commentary to it. So we had, we had a big wave of science-induced zombies for a while. Well, we're probably going to be a little bit before we see much pandemic fiction because tasteless and um, you don't want to go too close to what you're currently living with. So I would expect over the next few years for fictional monsters, especially in literature where you don't have to pay for CGI and props, I would expect it to go more monster monster, but then for the cycle to dip and, you know, the scariest books and the scariest horror is always the human monster. Jack Ketchum was the most frightening writer that's ever worked in American horror. Um, he never wrote a monster. He wrote all people. So I think that for the next few years, you're going to see a trend towards identifiable, vanquishable monster monsters. And then we'll see a shift towards human monster and then we may get back to more of the science generated virus pandemic disease or disease created monster but i think we're i think that's on i think that's going to be on a down downward trend for the next few years until we figure out how to make that not mirror the actual world quite as much. Yeah, I think that um, if you look at, for instance, how recent national and worldwide traumas have been treated in the immediate aftermath of them in fiction, then we tend to like to talk about sort of the after effects or the ripple effects of that crisis rather than the crisis itself. And my favorite example of this is the reboot of Battlestar Galactica, which followed pretty closely on the heels of 9-11 and is very much a 9-11 story, but is set way out in space and, and doesn't ever talk about 9-11 and it's 
someplace where they've never even heard of that. But they get to talk about a lot of the social and political ripple effects of that in a way that is really interesting and lets us also start processing some of our own experience there and some of the emotions we're feeling and some of the philosophical changes that people are going through and things like that. I suspect that in speculative fiction, the immediate aftermath of this, it, like John said, they're going to people who are smart and want to sell a book and not be thought of as really crass will stay away from pandemic fiction explicitly. But then we might see an uptick in sort of, um, I don't know the right word for it, I get doppelganger-ish fiction, things like uh, Invasion of the Body Snatchers, where the people around you become the threat. And that's a way to start to deal with that psychological ripple effect. I went for a walk in my neighborhood this morning and some guy in my neighborhood walked right past me like a foot away. And I said, hey, social distancing, buddy. Uh, and, and that sense of like being afraid of people who are near us and who otherwise would never have been a threat to us. I think that's something we're gonna try to figure out some way to process. I think the other way we're gonna try to process that, and I think the monster that will be big next is the Fae. I think there will be a ton of stories about the Fae and about changelings and about uh, you know kids getting replaced and parents getting replaced and whatever. I think there are a lot of interesting ways to go with that. I have a novel pitch about that, John, but I'm gonna save it until like 2023. And uh, I was totally just going to say that I would love to see you write some of this as soon as you finish out the stuff that's under contract. Right. The, the other, literally the other six books, but, you know, but, but after that, then we're going to talk about the Fae. So, I, but I think that that also touches on that right mix of like the magic and scientific. The Fae, if they're a creature, then there's something real about them, but there's also something magical about them. And so they're inherently something that science might shed light on, but not be able to solve. I think that's a really fun place to explore. And as monster types, I think that's going to be huge. We did an episode about the Brown Mountain Lights. And at the end of it is kind of a throwaway. I said, you know, what are my theories for what if, what are the, what are the other possible explanations? And I said, what if it's the Fae? That line, just like one sentence, got us more listener feedback than anything else in the entire show so far, because people said, oh, the Fae, nobody ever talks about the Fae, and I love them as a legend. So, I don't know. That person needs right. to read more urban fantasy, because there's a lot of fairy books, yeah, <laughs> and there are. Uh, there's some really good ones. Yeah, and uh, and uh, yeah, that's a good good point. I, I had started a novel a few years back, um, kind of in, along the lines of Interview with the Vampire or the the Vampire Chronicles from Anne Rice, that kind of style, but with uh, with fawns and satyrs, and uh, so I, I think that uh, you know, yeah, we're gonna see some fiction that that kind of parallels or is in response to some of the uh, social anxiety that we go through at the particular period as we always have in history. Um, and I was bringing up on another panel about uh, environmentalism and that that's so becoming more and more, you know, important right now that we, we focus on that. And I, I, I'm curious to see what scientifically we really do find as we are, the, our planet becomes more endangered because of ecological uh, terrorism and, and environmental uh, issues and, and warming of the planet and that kind of thing. What we either discover, what comes, comes out or, or, you know, mutates, et cetera, and then kind of becomes new modern folklore. You know, it's been a few decades since we had a really good remake of the thing. Mm-hmm. Sorry. Somebody, somebody get on that. Tyler Perry, you right there. Jump <laughs> on, baby. Medea meets the thing. The thing. The thang. <laughs> it's the thang, yes. A billion dollar idea, TP. Call me. Take my money. Take my money right now. I will go, I will reopen Regal Theaters to watch the thang. Tyler Perry's Medea. I love it. Just in time for Halloween. <laughs> That he could have it written, shot, and released yes. before Halloween. Before the panel ends today. <laughs> oh, yeah. Totally. I mean, he owns enough studio space. And he owns enough of Atlanta to just make it happen. 
That's right. Uh, and so, uh, speaking speaking of Faye, I love that. Uh, and and I don't know, Michael. Do you think that most of the people watching here uh, are familiar with the Brown uh, Mountain Lights? Because uh, I, I listened to that podcast episode as well and loved it. I'd love for you to you share with the audience. Sure. There's a mountain called Brown Mountain that's outside the town of Hickory, North Carolina. It's a pretty remote area, uh, and especially it was a remote area when this phenomenon first started being observed. But the phenomenon is that if you are at a distance from Brown Mountain, apparently people who are on Brown Mountain itself, when this phenomenon occurs, never actually see it happen around them. But if you're looking at Brown Mountain from a distance, from across Linville Gorge or from some other peak nearby, then what you'll see in the evening is lights, bright lights, sometimes multicolored, sometimes they're white lights, sometimes they're red lights. It depends on the account and the age of the account. But this has been recorded since at least the 18th century. You'll see lights appear way over the mountain and then start descending. They'll roam around the mountain. They'll lift back into the air. They'll just sort of drift around. And a lot of people have pointed to it and said, well, it's swamp gas or it's, you know, this or that or the other. There aren't any swamps on the side of mountains, it turns out. Who knew? Uh, at an angle, it's awfully hard for standing water to stand. <laughs> and uh, there are a lot of different theories that have been proposed that they're the headlights of cars, but these phenomena predate cars. The headlights of trains, but they predate trains in the area. And during documented, very well documented disasters, uh, there was a massive flood in Western North Carolina in 1916 that wiped out all travel in the area, all train travel, took out bridges, took out railroad lines, everything. And during that time period, it was also observed then. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's always evaded explanation. It's pretty reliable. There's a particular place called Wiseman's View where you can go up in the Blue Ridge Parkway and at night watch the Brown Mountain Lights happen. You know, it's been the subject of lots of fiction. There have been lots of its UFO movies. There's an episode of The X-Files that talks about Brown Mountain Lights, uh, things like that. But it's, it's a very interesting visual phenomenon. And uh, a lot of people have their own pet theory behind it. And I love that about it because what it does is reveal what's important to the person who came up with the theory. You know, um, John and I know a, a writer and storyteller from South Carolina named Tally Johnson, and we have an episode of Arcane Carolinas coming up at the end of the month where we talk to Tally and hear ghost stories from him and things like that. And Tally has been to Brown Mountain Lights and immediately identifies it as a ghost phenomenon. But I know a lot of people who have identified it definitively, they say, as a UFO phenomenon. And, it, you know, it, it really boils somebody else's beliefs down to what it is they want to talk about while remaining this persistent phenomenon that everyone agrees exists and no one can explain. And that goes back to that old saying that any science that's sufficiently advanced may as well be magic. Anything that we don't, that science hasn't explained yet may as well be fairies or may as well be, yes, it was a UFO. It flew, I can't identify it stamp it. It's a UFO. Don't know if it's a fairy UFO or a ghosty UFO, but I can't identify it and it was in the air. So by definition, it's unidentified. <laughs> Tally's got some great ones. Um, uh, he's got some great ones about places that we, that he and I have both been because I grew up about 10 miles from where Tally now lives in rural South Carolina. And some of those places are really creepy. Tally tells a great ghost story. <laughs> I went to a Florida restaurant. Uh, I, th I think it was actually called Alice's Restaurant, and it was right on the swamp. And we had to drive out down, you know, like gravel road for five miles or something in the last five miles that we got there. And it was, they were literally going out and, and getting the frogs from the swamp there to make the frog legs and, and so forth. And uh, that was one of the freakiest uh, <clears throat> dining experiences of my entire life. And I, my imagination ran wild with 
what might be uh, out that door and what, what we might have been eating. Uh, but <laughs> Those were frogs, bro. Yeah. <laughs> that, was, that was the last dude that couldn't pay the check. <laughs> the legs were a little bit meatier. I got, I got my bang from a buck there. Uh, <laughs> so going back before, we're going to need to start wrapping up here uh, in, in a little bit, but uh, going back to the Fay, and I think that fits in, uh, Allison, with some of the fiction that you've written. Um, do, do you want to talk about that? I want to say what seems really cool about the con, like if we do start going into more Fay horror or things. It's very alluring because I know some people would think like that's an awesome, like, like oh, if you're not careful, the fairies are going to take you away to the fairy realm and replace you with the doppelganger who everyone's going to love better than you because they'll be perfect and you'll be in this other magical realm. And I'd be like, yeah, that sounds kind of awesome. Can we, can we do that? So it's kind of a, like it should be scary, but it's also kind of alluring, which I think is kind of the creepiest monstrous thing out there. It's when something really is bad, but you're like, it kind of sounds awesome. I want, I try it if I wanted to. So I think that's kind of the most. Let's say the most sinister evil is the alluring kind. It draws you in. So I think that'd be an, an excellent genre to see more of. In fact, um, I've seen a couple. Weirdly enough, it's in the realm of haunted houses and haunted mazes, where I've seen like Revenge of the Tooth Fairy. So there, there are people who love that concept where it's like. Oh, the tooth fairy! If you don't give her your tooth, you're going to be in trouble. And then all of a sudden, the haunted house becomes full of like it's an evil dentist's office where kids are dragged away, and tooth fairy is like has drills and they're drilling out all their teeth. Like people really like this genre, interestingly enough. Interesting, interesting. Uh, yeah, I'm curious as we we get the uh, UFO the, the from from the White House and and uh, Area 51 and other organizations maybe possibly documentation released what what that will uh do to our modern folklore and then now that you know spacex is going to basically be having space taxis pretty soon uh we'll see how that affects you know what we what we take into space and what we encounter in space or possibly uh, as well as we run out of places maybe on our own planet to <laughs> to screw up Right, exactly. Uh, you know, I and I came across this. Uh, I was listening to some Lovecraft uh, recently from one of his stories, uh, Ex Oblivione, and he said, uh, "For doubt and secrecy are the lure of lures, and no new horror can be more terrible than the horror of the commonplace." And so I, I think that there is some truth to our human curiosity of wanting to believe that oh somebody says no this doesn't exist and and like you were saying john like no uh, you've got to come and see it i've got to go and find it i've got i've got to uh, eliminate all doubt and and go and explore this unexplored uh, area and, and no matter what people or even more because people have said that you shouldn't and then there's always that one guy sitting back at the end saying yeah how'd that work out for you <laughs> all right let's see here uh so we've probably got about two or three more minutes before we need to start wrapping up and i'll give all of you an opportunity to tell everybody where they can find you online uh, do you have any last uh, uh folklore monster local stories that uh, you would like to share with anybody watching today aaron with monsterama specifically wanted me to talk about the omaha lake monster so let me yes. take like 30 seconds a minute to talk about that because it's fascinating. In the 1920s, a newspaper uh, started printing stories about what eventually came to be known as Giganticus Bruturvius out of uh, a lake outside of Omaha. And uh, specifically, this is from uh, Lake Walgren, which is in Sheridan County. It's near Hay Springs. And that the initial reports were that it was sort of a, a big animal, but not necessarily a monster. And then the reports became, well, it's uh, it's shaped like an alligator, but it's bigger than an alligator. And then people were saying, well, there aren't a lot of alligators in Nebraska, as one would imagine or expect. But then eventually the reports became that it's, you know, a 30, 40 foot long horned serpent monster that lives in this 50 acre lake and is eating people and eating animals and all kinds of reports. 
And it's really fascinating to me as a local monster legend because it, it otherwise like perfectly conforms to the bog standard expectation of local monster legend, local lake monster legend, except that it's something that has been sort of consciously added to over time. And so by the 1960s, local publications were printing that it hadn't been seen in a while because the town had made a conscious choice to begin ignoring it and thus drive it away from consensual reality, which I think is a fascinating twist and a little fayish around the edges too, if you really get down to it. Um, ultimately, the first stories about it were printed by this guy named John uh, Mayer or Marr. I'm not exactly sure how to pronounce his name. He was a local reporter and politician and kind of a well-known, uh, I don't know, cryptozoological gadfly. Uh, he did a lot of fun stuff like create a fake uh, sort of pilt down man and bury it in a field and then pay some people to find it. And then he sold stories about that to newspapers back east. Uh, he did all kinds of fun stuff like that and was known as a big hoaxer. And so the idea of this lake monster being something that everybody figured out right away was probably a hoax. And then people just embraced and made their local mascot and started spinning in new directions and coming up with new variations on the whole story to the point that when the town celebrated its centennial in the 1980s, they sold t-shirts with the monster on it because why not? You can buy normie t-shirts in Lake Norman. It's genius. They're very yeah. proud. They're very proud of their completely town constructed lake monster. Yeah. Because the lake was built. There are no ancient monsters in Lake Norman because it's not an ancient lake. <laughs> it might be the world's biggest, most angry radioactive catfish, but it is not a plesiosaur. <laughs> because otherwise, if it is, that plesiosaur waddled 250 miles from the ocean and is now living in fresh water. Well, not salt water. Look, well, it's a loose definition of fresh. <laughs> but yeah, I, I, I really feel like that part of North Carolina felt left out because it didn't have a monster, so somebody made it up. And they're like, okay, well, we're gonna, we have a lake. It sounds like the Jason Voorhees of, of uh, big fish monsters. It's even more scary because it just goes really slowly. And as it swims really slowly, it makes the same, it goes, ch -ch -ch. <sighs> I've never heard a fish monster do that, but Normie does, man. Normie makes the Michael Myers noise. Ch -ch -ch. <sighs> there, it's now folklore. Yes, here, buy the t-shirt. Been there, done there, <laughs> got the t-shirt. <laughs> uh, thank you, Michael, for that. Uh, Justine, Allison, anything? Anything else you want to share before we go around the horn? All right. Well, uh, it was a true pleasure. This was a, a fun panel. And uh, I want to give each of you an opportunity to tell everybody where you are uh, on the uh, interwebs and where they can find you and your stuff. Well, I'll go first. Um... Georgia Reptile Society, so you can find us at gareptilesociety.org. Oh, um, you can find me, uh, my books on Amazon, Goodreads, pretty much any major online retailer, and for Facebook and Twitter, my label is AR Cook Author. You can find me and links to my Facebook and my newsletter and all that kind of stuff at www.michaelgwilliamsbooks.com. Uh, you can find my books at a website that I'm pretty sure John is about to give you. Uh, but I'll say it too, because never hearst hear it twice, falstaffbooks.com. And you can find out more about Arcane Carolinas at www.arcanecarolinas.com. Or on a podcast app or Spotify. You can find me at johnhartness.com, but the more reliable ways of finding out about my work and the work of the 50 plus other authors that we publish is going to falstaffbooks.com. You can also, for more communication and more cat pictures, one of which I took while we were doing the panel, 
You can join my Facebook group, which is John G. Hartness Books, and you can join the Falstaff Facebook group to find out about new releases, freebies, ARC teams, and appearances. It's called The Misfit Toys. So if you look for John G. Hartness Books and The Misfit Toys, those are two Facebook groups, very active. You can join those and talk to a lot of your favorite writers and some soon-to-be favorite writers. Awesome. Great stuff. Well, this has been a true pleasure for me as a longtime Atlanta convention goer and a proud member of the Dead Pirates of Sci-Fi fandom. Uh, I, I am... Uh, just, this was fantastic, and thank you for contributing to Monsterama uh, 2020. And don't forget, uh, this year's virtual Monsterama 2020 is benefiting the MPTF Motion Picture and Television Fund, which provides temporary financial assistance for needs created or complicated by the COVID-19 pandemic. So if any of you that are watching and you're driving down the road, maybe somewhere east of Omaha, and you happen to see a monster or maybe hear a radio commercial about one of the movies that was pitched during today's panel, it might be produced by those people that are members of the MPTF. So with that, thanks everybody for watching this panel. Enjoy the rest of your Monsterama. Thanks everybody. Bye.